I'm Blake Leith. Welcome to episode 10 of the Gratitude Series. Faithfulness and Conclusion. Those of you who have been patient and present for all nine preceding episodes, I thank you for your faithfulness as together we explored leading and living with heart, love, optimism, joy, vocational and relational peace, self-control as evidenced through patience, perseverance, and personal discipline, and episode nine's kindness, goodness, gentleness, character, and integrity. This fruit comprised November's harvest of gratitude, and though I conclude today with one final story, my hope is that our collective gratitude will live on and in and through every single one of us every single day. I hope to return in several days with December's series of gifts, but I leave you now with a recollection by Robert Fulgham from his book, It Was On Fire When I Lay Down On It. I share it as a counterbalance to the inner critic inside each of us, the heckler, the self-doubter, the devil, the one who discourages us from trying to do any good in the world, because why bother? Nothing really matters anyway. It won't make a hill of beans difference. There's no point. Who do I think I am? I'm not worthy. I'm no good. I can't. I shouldn't. I won't. So I'll just hide under the covers and watch the world burn if you don't mind. In a 2021 documentary... John Herzog asked Sylvester Stallone, why did you write Rocky? To which Sly replied, I guess it was in lieu of talking to a therapist. Everyone dreams of having an opportunity to go for it one time. If you fail, which quite often happens, at least you had the opportunity. When that opportunity is denied and you never get that moment to shine, to show what you have, that's what drives people insane. Like, I just want to know, did I have it or did I not? If I fail, I fail, but at least I tried. This is much the same spirit with which Teddy Roosevelt, some 111 years prior, described the man in the arena who, at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Now, it's true. We can't boil the ocean. And at the risk of mixing too many metaphors here, it's equally true that we miss every ball we don't swing at. And there's ample evidence indicating we can and do make a positive difference in the lives of others, often by just showing up, by simply being there, available, as others are in our own lives. So keep the faith. Keep leaning into a mission-driven, meaningfully led life, uprightly and forwardly, step after step, After step, after step, after step, after step. Get busy. Die empty and full. And leave it better than you found it. And now, onward to Robert's recollection from chapter 29. Are there any questions? An offer that comes at the end of college lectures and long meetings, said when an audience is not only overdosed with information, but when there's no time left anyhow. At times like that, you sure do have questions, like, can we leave now? Or, what the hell was this meeting about anyway? Or, where can I get a drink? The gesture is supposed to indicate openness on the part of the speaker. But if, in fact, you do ask a question, both the speaker and the audience will give you drop-dead looks. And some fool, some earnest idiot always asks, 
and the speaker always has answers, usually by repeating most of what he said already. But if there's a little time left and there's a little silence in response to the invitation, I usually ask the most important question of all. What is the meaning of life? You never know. Somebody might have an answer. And I'd really hate to miss it because I was too socially inhibited to ask. But when I ask, it's usually taken as a kind of absurdist move. People laugh and nod and gather up their stuff and the meaning is dismissed on that ridiculous note. Once, and only once, I asked that question and got a serious answer. One that is with me still. First, I must tell you where it happened. Because the place has a power of its own. Greece. Near the village of Gonia, on a rocky bay on the island of Crete, sits a Greek Orthodox monastery. Alongside it, on land donated by the monastery, is an institute dedicated to human understanding and peace, and especially to rapprochement between Germans and Cretans. An improbable task, given the bitter residue of wartime. This site is important because it overlooks the small airstrip at Malem where Nazi paratroopers invaded Crete and were attacked by peasants wielding kitchen knives and hay scythes. The retribution was terrible. The populations of whole villages were lined up and shot for assaulting Hitler's troops. High above the Institute is a cemetery with a single cross marking the mass grave of Cretan partisans. And across the bay, on yet another hill, is the regimented burial ground of the Nazi paratroopers. The memorials are so placed that all might see and never forget. Hate was the only weapon the Cretans had at the end, and it was a weapon many vowed to never give up. Never, ever. Against this heavy curtain of history, in this place where the stone of hatred is hard and thick, the existence of an institute devoted to healing the wounds of war is a fragile paradox. How has it come to be here? The answer is a man. Alexander Papaderos. A doctor of philosophy, teacher, politician, resident of Athens, but a son of this soil. At war's end, he came to believe that the Germans and the Cretans had much to give one another, much to learn from the other, that they had an example to set. For if they could forgive each other and construct a creative relationship, then surely anyone could. To make a lovely story short, Papaderos succeeded. The Institute became a reality, a conference ground on the site of horror. And it was, in fact, a source of productive interaction between the two countries. Books have been written on the dreams that were realized by what people gave to people in this place. By the time I came to the Institute for a summer session, Alexander Papaderos had become a living legend. One look at him and you saw strength, intensity, energy, physical power, courage, intelligence, passion, and vivacity radiated from the man. And to speak to him, to shake his hand, to be in a room with him when he spoke, was to experience his extraordinary electric humanity. Few people live up to their reputations when you get close. But Alexander Papaderos is an exception. At the last session on the last morning of a two-week seminar on Greek culture, led by intellectuals and experts in their fields who were recruited by Papaderos from across Greece, Papaderos rose from his chair at the back of the room and walked to the front, where he stood in the bright Greek sunlight of an open window and looked out. We followed his gaze across the bay to the Iron Cross marking the German cemetery. He turned. And then he made the ritual gesture. Are there any questions? Quiet quilted the room. These two weeks had generated enough questions for a lifetime. 
But for now, there was only silence. No questions? Papadero swept the room with his eyes. So, I asked. Dr. Papaderos, what is the meaning of life? The usual laughter followed, and people stirred to go. Papaderos held up his hand and stilled the room and looked at me for a long time, asking with his eyes if I was serious and seeing from my eyes that I was. I will answer your question. Taking his wallet out of his hip pocket, he fished into a leather billfold and brought out a very small round mirror about the size of a quarter. And what he said went like this. When I was a child during the war, we were very poor and we lived in a remote village. One day, on the road, I found the broken pieces of a mirror. A German motorcycle had been wrecked in that place. I tried to find all the pieces and put them back together, but it was not possible. So I kept only the largest piece, this one. And by scratching it on a stone, I made it round. I began to play with it as a toy and became fascinated by the fact that I could reflect light into dark into places where the sun could never shine, in deep holes and crevices and dark closets in our home. It became a game for me to get light into the most inaccessible places I could find. I kept the mirror, and as I went about growing up, I would take it out in idle moments and continue the challenge of the game. As I became a man, I grew to understand this was not just a child's game, but a metaphor for what I might do with my life. I came to understand that I am not the light nor the source of light, but light, truth, understanding, knowledge, is there, and it will only shine in many dark places if I reflect it. I am a fragment of a mirror whose whole design and shape I do not know. Nevertheless, With what I have, I can reflect light into the dark places of this world, into the black places in the hearts of men, and change some things in some people. Perhaps others may see and do likewise. This is what I am about. This is the meaning of my life. And then he took his small mirror and, holding it carefully, caught the bright rays of daylight streaming through the window and reflected them both onto my face and onto my hands folded upon my desk. Much of what I experienced in the way of information about Greek culture and history that summer is gone from memory. But in the wallet of my mind, I carry a small round mirror still. Are there any questions? In conclusion, I hope Alexander Papaderos' example of faithfulness despite the odds, of fighting the good fight regardless, of affecting change from wherever he stands and with whatever he has, encourages you as much as it encourages me. Remember, Reaching great means you're only halfway there, because if we're fortunate, great full is where we hope to arrive in the end. So let your little light shine, won't you? And if you can't return in a matter of days for December's series of gifts, I'll hope to see you on the road. Godspeed. Godspeed.